share it with others who aren't able to join. All right, so with that, welcome to our November community forum. Um, again, please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know what brought you here today and where you're zooming in from. So the format for today's session, we do want to hear from you. We'd love to hear your questions, your feedback. Um, you can send those to us in the chat. You can raise your hand. You're welcome to speak up during the discussion and ask those questions throughout the discussion. Um, when you're not speaking, we do ask that you mute yourself so that we can hear our presenter clearly. And as I mentioned, we will be recording this or we are recording this to be um, viewed for others later on. And we will have a short pre or post meeting feedback survey and that will pop up at the end. Okay, so with these community forums, really our goal is to move together toward equity and better outcomes in breast cancer for everyone and, and also in health, just health in general, not necessarily breast cancer. And some of the topics that we'll touch on are, are just um, overviews and tips and information about general health as well as for breast cancer. Again, we've been doing these forums for about two years and really trying to uh, bring the community together, have our scientific experts um, hear your questions, what matters to you, what topics you want to hear about, and give you access to answers and information that may be helpful for you in, in your life too. So we have had a whole host of different topics to date um, across the spectrum of breast cancer screening and prevention, risk factors, deeper dives into certain risk factors like breast density and genetics, as well as breast cancer risk across the, the lifetime. So um, for this month and for today, we will be discussing the topic of fiber and your health and your microbiome. Um, so we're really excited to have our guest speaker here today, um, Dr. Katrine Whiteson, who is at UC Irvine. She's an associate professor and also co-director of the UC Irvine Microbiome Center. Um, Laura Esserman will be joining here momentarily as well. She's caught on an, another call, but she will be joining um, to help mediate and ask questions. We have some poll questions we'd love to hear from you on. Um, so without further ado, I will stop sharing and have Dr. Whiteson go ahead and get started. Great, thank you very much. Um, let me give this a try. I'm Katrina Whiteson and I'm Zooming to you from SoCal. I see some of the other participants are also Zooming from SoCal. Um, I'm in my office on the campus of UC Irvine. And I'm just gonna get my slides going here, hopefully. Great, can you guys confirm that you're seeing the whole slide? Great. Yes. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to have a chance to share a little bit about the research that I've been doing in my lab. Um, and, you know, I'm not only going to talk about my own lab, I'm happy to share what I've learned from the research in our field in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, so it's been a very exciting time to be a microbiome scientist. So my lab studies all the microbes that live on a human body um, in health and in disease. And, um, and I'm going to hopefully convince you that eating fiber can have a really big impact on your health. And I welcome questions. I'll try to keep my eyes on the chat and I'll try to leave lots of time for questions. And um, I just wanted to say that I am on. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Katrine. And uh, just wanted to say that I am super, super excited about the work Katrine's doing and the work that we're doing together. Well, me too. And I'll I'll even bring that up. So that'll be fun. Um, thank you. So um, okay. So here you see. Um, my title slide, I'll just point out that, um, as I mentioned, I'm zooming to you from SoCal. Irvine is between Los Angeles and San Diego. We're near the mountains and the ocean, and I've shared my email here. I'll bring it up again at the end if anybody would like to contact me. 
Um, so before I get too far, um, I'll just define a microbiome. So microbiomes are the collections of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and other microbes that live in a particular environment. And in the last 10 or 15 years, the methods for studying microbiomes have become a lot more, let they become less expensive and more accessible. And so we now have a mountain of data coming from people with all different kinds of health conditions and telling us that the types of microbes that live, especially in the gut, but also in other parts of our bodies, um, are correlated with our health. So people who um, have obesity have a particular microbial signature, certain types of microbes living in their gut. The same goes for different cancer types, for autoimmune diseases. Um, our brain chemistry is very much impacted by the trillions of microbes living in our guts and processing all of the food and other molecules that come through our system. Even our vaccine efficacy is heavily influenced by our microbiome. So if you were um, going to get a vaccine, I would encourage you to try to get your microbiome into good shape before you do that, because it will help your vaccine be as um, powerful as possible. Um, so anyhow, I will hopefully have convinced you of that by the end of our talk. Um, our microbes are with us throughout our lives. So we're certainly influenced by microbes even before we're born and certainly by the molecules that our mother's gut microbiomes are processing, which reach us through our blood. Um, and then when we're born, we are colonized by the microbes of the people and the environment around us. Our microbiomes tend to be quite individual. They run in households um, and they affect our health all, th all the way through aging. They're super individual. So each of the people on this call has a specific microbiome that's unique to them. And, you know, five or 10 years ago, it would have been harder for me to have a slide like this with advice for how we can engineer our microbiomes. But this is something that we're getting better at, I would say. And I have a lot of hope that we are going to be able to engineer our microbiomes to promote health. Um, so what are some of the tools we have right now? Well, we've got probiotics and prebiotics, probiotics being live cultures like yogurt or like the ones you can buy in capsules at the store. Um, prebiotics like fiber are microbial accessible nutrients. So this is when you eat whole foods that gives the um, that takes longer to digest, it will persist all the way down into your colon and give your microbes something to eat. So eating whole foods that contain fiber is probably the most important thing you can do to promote a healthy microbiome. There's other areas of research that my lab is also involved in that I'd be happy to answer questions about, like fecal transplants, where um, we take a healthy person's gut microbiome and transplant it into somebody who's having trouble, especially with antibiotic associated infections like C. diff, and also phage therapy. These are viruses that kill bacteria that we can use as alternatives to antibiotics if you have an antibiotic resistant infection. So in my lab, we've been leading these really fun studies in undergraduate classes where we have the students eat a really high fiber diet for two weeks and we take fecal samples from them before and after so that we can see how the high fiber diet influences their microbiome. And here you can see one of our classrooms, a grad student from my lab, Andrew Oliver, who's the first author on the paper. He was also the TA for the class and he had to act a bit like a camp counselor, get everybody to drink enough water and so on. Um, and also show them how to collect the samples and analyze the data. So it was very fun. Um, I think everybody in that lab laughed more than really for pretty much any other class. It was, it was very fun. Recently, we've been doing a series of seminars together with a teaching kitchen here at UC Irvine that has been developed as a, a UCI culinary health program. It's in the Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute, and these lectures are free and open to the public. Um, I'm happy to make sure that link is, maybe we can put it in the chat or something like that, um, if anybody's interested. So we've been having these monthly lectures with a, with a chef, Chef Jessica Van Roo, and she cooks microbiome healthy recipes and I give a little lecture about the nutrients in that particular recipe and it's been very fun I always learn a lot from chef Jess and it's a really beautiful kitchen so that's a cool opportunity that's free and open to everyone
So why are we talking about cancer and the microbiome? Well, can, uh, the microbiome is involved in a lot of different stages of cancer development. So um, the, the composition of your gut microbiome uh, influences your immune health, and that has a big influence on risk for cancer development. Um, even tumors have a microbiome. So many tumors are colonized by different kinds of microbes, bacteria and fungi, and sometimes that influences cancer treatment. So for example, if the microbe that's colonizing your tumor can break down the cancer treatment drug, that will have an influence on whether the treatment can be effective. Um, that's also true in terms of the interactions between the gut microbiome and immune health that I was just talking about. So the microbiome impacts cancer treatment success for a lot of reasons that we're just starting to understand. Um, and that's also true for recovery from cancer treatment. One of my favorite studies in the last year came from a group in Texas at the MD Anderson um, Cancer Center. And they found that the people in their study who were eating a high fiber diet had a much better success rate for immunotherapy. These were people who had melanoma. Um, but they found that it turned out that eating a high fiber diet was associated with much better outcomes. And actually, maybe surprisingly, the opposite was true for probiotics. So taking probiotics, if anything, had a negative impact on cancer treatment success. Here's the data so you can see it with your own eyes. Um, so here, this green line is showing you the people in the study who were eating more than 20 grams of fiber per day, they just got this information from surveys. And then they followed um, their, their survival probability um, in these groups where with either higher or lower fiber, and they found that there were much better outcomes for the people who were eating more fiber in this study. So what do we mean when we're talking about fiber? Well, fibers are complex chains of, of glucoses and sugars, carbohydrate polymers. So they're just chains of these sugars. Um, and they're not something that our own human enzymes are good at breaking down. Um, so plants store a lot of their own energy in the form of fiber, and that's what's often giving the plant structure. Uh, but, as, but the human system is not good at breaking down the, the fibers quickly or really at all. And so when we eat whole foods, we get more fiber into our diets. And so where can we find them? Basically, non-processed plant-based foods. So vegetables, fruits, beans, whole grains, nuts, and seeds are all important sources of fiber. Um, although the modern food processing um, approaches that we often use, even making wheat flour, for example, removes a lot of the fiber from the wheat. So we're, our guts are being starved of this really important nutrient. So fiber, as I mentioned, is found in plant-based foods and can promote better digestive health, help achieve healthy weight, uh, reduce chronic disease risk, including um, some of the ones we've mentioned, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. Um, and one reason is that when you eat fiber, it helps to avoid blood sugar spikes. So when you eat a whole food, even fruit that tastes very sweet, but has a lot of fiber in it, um, the fiber will essentially trap the sugar and kind of make it absorb more slowly so that you will not get as much of a blood sugar spike when you're eating that food. We have a huge fiber gap in the United States. So um, it's estimated that we need 20 to 40 grams of fiber a day. And the average American is probably only getting about 15 grams a day or about half of, of what's thought to be uh, required. So as I mentioned, fiber is not something we digest directly, but it turns out our gut microbes have the right tools for breaking it down. And um, our gut right microbes are living in our colon. And if we eat fiber, the fiber persists through our digestive tract. It's not being quickly absorbed. And then that essentially gives our gut microbes their favorite fuels. So for, from the gut microbe perspective, the fiber is an energy source, but it has important health consequences in a lot of different ways, especially for our immune systems to have fiber getting into our colon. 
Um, this was a really nice article in the New York Times recently highlighting the fact that most people in the United States are not getting enough fiber. And they highlight 12 fiber filled foods, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, these are many of the foods that the students in our classes are turning to as well. And I didn't know, for example, before doing these studies that avocados are high in fiber. I knew they were high in healthy fats, but it's kind of amazing that they also are quite high in fiber. Um, beans are, and lentils are just an amazing and fast way to get a lot of fiber. Um, as I'm going to show you about half of the carbohydrates in the form of beans are half of the carbohydrates you find in beans are in the form of fiber. Raspberries, berries in general are very sweet, but very high in fiber. So that's an amazing source. Uh, chia seeds, which are pretty easy to sprinkle in your yogurt. Um, are another important source and all of the carbohydrates and chia seeds are in the form of fiber. So you can very quickly fill your fiber gap by eating some of these foods. And, you know, it's impossible to completely revolutionize your, all of our dietary habits, but even if everyone just picked one of these things, like try to eat beans every day or try to put chia seeds in your yogurt every day, just picking one of these things and adding it can have a really big impact on your health. And I want to yes. point out, oh yeah. Oh. Can I ask you a question real quick? Back yeah. on the other slide, the amounts that are listed there, is that the amount of each of those that is recommended on a daily basis? So like one uh, cup of cooked quinoa or half an avocado, does that fulfill the fiber need or is there? Oh, you want to get 20 plus, right? So yeah, exactly. So it's, it shows you here the number of grams and it's not very big. So maybe I should make this bigger for you guys, but see how it shows, for example, with the cup of cooked broccoli that that's five grams. So you would need to eat four cups of broccoli to get 20 grams of fiber. And I mean, that's a bit ridiculous, but if you picked four of these things, you would probably get yourself up to those 20 grams. And then another question that came in is about whether it's, is it important? And I think you've just answered this, but is it important to have a variety or just the amount? So you said you could fulfill it by doing chia seeds in your yogurt, or is it better to do many different things to get to that 20? Does it, does that matter? That's a science question. I love that question. And I hope we know the answer in 10 years. Um, the studies I have seen suggest that the biggest priority is just getting some fiber. So whatever you think you can succeed with would be my first advice. So if there's something on here that appeals to you and really nothing else does, then go for it. Probably and diversity is important. I mean, I think it'd be better to get a diversity, but getting nothing is so much worse than than focusing too much on getting it perfect. And and Katrina, I think that like all the fleshy things like butternut squash or any of the fleshy mm -hmm. um, vegetables, spaghetti squash, any of those things would probably all have a lot of fiber too, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. Pump, like even canned pumpkin is a pretty easy thing to get your hands on. And that's really good in high fiber. Lately, uh, my family, we've been putting canned pumpkin in yogurt with chia seeds in the morning, which I never thought would be good, but actually it's pretty good. We've been eating that lately and it definitely has fiber. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, I guess I really think it's important to say that it's better to not let perfect be the enemy of the good. And I think in general, that eating fiber in any form is going to have positive impact. And if you have digestive issues that make one of these sources harder than another, you know, don't worry about exactly how you do it. Just picking some things to get some fiber will make a big difference. You can even eat fiber fortified cereals if that's easier, you know. And that there was another question in the chat about um, leaky gut syndrome. And, you mm -hmm. know, maybe there are certain types of fiber that are more related to that. Um, I don't know if you can comment on that too. Yeah, sure. I'll actually skip ahead to a slide that talks about that a little bit. So, so here's another similar model where, you know, you eat the fiber, it gives your gut bacteria a chance to break it down into fermentation products, um, which leads to the production of these molecules, the short chain fatty acids, which those are actually the favorite fuels of the cells lining your intestine. And so one reason we get leaky gut is that when we're not eating fiber and we're starving those cells of their favorite fuels, the junctions that keep these cells together start to fall apart. And that's how you end up with leaky gut. But actually, I, I hear the question. The question was, are there some kinds of fiber that are better than others at preventing leaky gut? 
I mean, to be honest, just getting fiber is the most important thing. Ideally, it would be a combination of insoluble and soluble fibers. And the best way to get that is by eating whole foods. So if you're getting your, your fiber from plants, as opposed to a pill or a supplement, for example, you're more likely to get a nice combination of insoluble and soluble fibers, which will form a lattice inside your gut. I mean, it's funny, I used to think of fiber as roughage. Like I know as a kid, you know, you hear about fiber kind of as roughage to clean out your intestine or something like that. Um, and that is true that the fiber will help with that, but really fiber is very slimy and squishy. Like think about, I don't know if you've ever tried adding water to chia seeds and watching what happens to the texture, um, or if adding water to psyllium husks or metamucil, it gets kind of gloopy and sticky. And that's very helpful in your gut. That's helping your whole digestive process slow down and, um, and, you know, if you can get that combination of insoluble and soluble fibers, I think that's the most important for avoiding leaky gut. And you mentioned, sorry to interrupt again, you mentioned Metamucil. That was another question that came up. What are your thoughts regarding products like Metamucil? Well, actually, here's my main take home message on whether it matters what kind of fiber you eat. And these are not even my words. This is a colleague who did a study where they compared three different fiber supplements and they found that all of them had a very positive impact, especially on people who were very low in getting fiber because they had so much room for improvement. So, you know, it doesn't really matter which fiber you choose, just get more fiber would be my first answer to that question. Um, and then in terms of supplements, like whether Metamucil or Inulin or another supplement is better, I mean, in my mind, the, the least processed is better if possible. Like you can buy psyllium husk powder or capsules at Trader Joe's or Costco or something like that. That might be better in terms of being a plant-based food. Um, but no, I mean, at this point, I would say what you can tolerate and what works in your life is the priority would be my, my main thoughts there. And yeah, just speaking of having it be accessible, um, some of these suggestions don't have to be expensive. So like here's, this is a picture from Trader Joe's uh, recently in the frozen berry section and frozen berries are surprisingly not expensive. Um, and you can just get so much good nutrients from berries. And then here's beans and um, they're just such a good deal. I mean, you could feed your family with beans. I mean, if you had an onion and one of these bags of beans, you could make a great meal and it would have protein and fiber and really restore a lot of the missing nutrients that we tend to be missing in our society right now. Um, actually, speaking of beans, uh, you know, I'd like to have a moment to look at the nutrition labels. So when you look at a nutrition label, you can see that the carbohydrates are broken down into the total carbohydrates and then the amount of that total that comes from fiber. So in the white bread example um, that I have on the left, you can see there's 23 grams of fiber and only one of those grams, sorry, 23 grams of carbohydrate and only one of those grams is in the form of fiber, which tells you that the wheat has been processed and the fiber has been removed. Over here with the whole wheat bread, 19 grams of carbs, four grams of fiber. So there, more of the fiber remains in the bread. It's probably still been processed. This is probably not as healthy of a food source of fiber as eating beans, for example, but still you're getting some fiber and it will avoid blood sugar spikes because of all the reasons we just talked about. When you get the fiber into your system, it helps to essentially form a little web, trapping some of those nutrients, slowing down the absorption of the sugar, so that you don't have as much of a spike um, compared to drinking juice or eating sugar in a really pure form. Here's an example of black beans. So 20 grams of carbs and almost half of them, 8.3 grams in this label are coming from fiber. So beans and lentils are just really, really high in fiber. So there's even a study at MD Anderson where the intervention is a cup of old Navy beans every day. And by eating that cup of beans, they're essentially filling their fiber gap just with that one cup of beans. Figuring out how to cook beans can feel intimidating coming from dry beans, but actually it can be very simple. I mean, literally just stick them in a pot with some water or broth and cook them for a few hours until they're soft and they're delicious. And you can also use canned beans, that's totally fine. 
Um, some people believe that changing the soaking water will help alleviate the gas problem that beans are famous for. And that might be true for some people. It's worth experiencing, experimenting with that. Um, some people worry that you're going to throw away some of the vitamins and goodness when you do this. I mean, that could be true too. There's an herb that's used in Mexican cooking a lot called epazote that's thought to help. And that might be nicer than having to throw it the soaking water away. But I love this. Is, this is from the Rancho Gordo Bean um, Club. And they say research reaches no definitive conclusions. And that's true. This type of research is really hard to do. Everybody's so individual how they respond to a food. So, um, you know, maybe the answer is just to eat more beans, which is their hilarious advice here. But I think it makes a lot of sense that if you especially introduce yourself a little bit at a time, you could build your tolerance. Another fun thing you can do with beans uh, to improve their nutrient profile is to sprout them. So here's some, these are also the Rancho Gordo beans sprouted in a mason jar and you get to see what the seedlings look like from each type. And it's actually also not that hard. You just soak them in water overnight and then drain them out and let them sit. You rinse them once a day and let them sit dry to sprout. And that gets, there's less carbs in the sprouts because they get used up when the um, seedling is sprouting, and then you get all kinds of other new nutrients from there. Um, this is a really cool article I just saw, I heard in, on NPR um, about how eating fiber will actually even boost levels of an ozempic-like hormone. So if you guys have been hearing this craze about ozempic, um, eating fiber will actually help um, in some of the same ways that taking ozempic will help. And the main advice coming from this group of scientists is also to eat more fiber. Um, okay, I wanna get to tell you guys a little bit about the, um, the study that we did here at UCI. Um, and actually I have two more for sources of inspiration that, um, that helped us decide how to design our study. One is that in a big public science project where they followed, um, a thousand people's diets carefully, they found that a diversity of plants in the diet was associated with, with health and with a higher gut microbial diversity. So that answers the question about, you know, is it okay? Do you need to get a diversity of all of these different plants? Is it okay to just go with one? Well, this study found that people eating more different kinds of plants in a week overall had higher gut microbial diversity. But I do have to say, that this could just be that it's typically the case that people eating more, more plants are eating more different types of plants. This is not evidence that says that eating just, you know, for example, a cup of beans a day wouldn't end up getting you to the same place. And I can tell you that people in parts of the world where they get most of their carbohydrates from root vegetables that are very high in fiber or from corn mush, which um, when cooked becomes very high in fiber, they have very little access to a diversity of foods and their gut microbiome diversity is very high. So I think it's just eating the fiber that really matters. And then, okay, my last source of inspiration before I tell you guys about the study um, is that in this, in this one, they compared eating a high fiber diet with adding fermented foods like yogurt, kimchi, kombucha, um, really any fermented vegetable counts vinegar, for example. Also, um, when they added fermented foods to a high fiber diet on the, on the excess axis, you're looking at time through weeks. And on the Y axis, you're looking at all the different types of microbes that are present in the people in this study. And you'll notice that in purple, the trend is that the microbial diversity is going up through the weeks when people had fermented foods in their diet as well. Whereas adding just the fiber in a short-term intervention didn't immediately lead to a big increase in microbial diversity across the board. And maybe you need to wait a bit longer. We think it takes a year or a year and a half to really permanently alter your gut microbiome. But um, this suggests to me that adding fermented foods to the diet, which has a lot of molecules that the microbes love, can really promote a healthy diversity of microbes in your gut. So for our study, we asked the question of how um, changing the whole diet so that it's high in, in fiber, how will that change 
the gut microbiome and the presence of the fermentation products from the fiber in the gut. And we had 26 students in our study. It was very brief. You know, we just followed them for a week and then did the fiber intervention for two weeks. So your first question might be, well, did we actually get these students to increase their fiber intake? And we really did. So in the first week, some of the students had as little as zero grams of fiber in their diet. And on average, they were much like the US getting less than 20 grams a day. Um, but in weeks two and three of our study, you can see they increased to more than 40 and nearly 50 grams of fiber per day. And so in this study, we actually gave the students meals, two meals a day um, to help them accomplish this. And I got the meals from a company called Thistle, where each meal had something like 16 to 20 grams of fiber. So two meals like that a day, plus we counseled them to add other high fiber foods to their diet. Um, so what were some of those foods? Here you can see um, that a lot of people ate seeds like flax and chia seeds, oatmeal, broccoli, um, high fiber breads or tortillas. Some of those might have had supplements in them. Fruits like berries and kiwis and apples. Um, we talked about avocados being so surprisingly high in fiber despite how they seem so creamy. Um, Salads are on the list, but to be honest, salads are really not what you need to get a high fiber diet going. I mean, salads are great if you add beans and nuts and other high fiber foods to them, but lettuce on its own doesn't have so much fiber. So you would need to eat an astonishing amount of lettuce to get the fiber intake covered. Um, and then as you can see, some students were relying on fiber bars. And then, you know, my favorite I keep talking about are the lentils and the beans and the peas. A lot of students were eating those. So if you want to see what happened to their gut microbiomes, um, this is an interesting way of looking at it. So here's the, the 26 or so people in the study grouped together. And um, the samples that were taken before the intervention have a gray bar underneath them, and the samples taken after the intervention have a red bar. And um, then you can see the composition of all the different types of bacteria in their guts are represented by the different colors in each column. And the main thing you can see is just that each person is quite distinct. So everyone has their own microbiome. But within that, during the period of the intervention, you do see expansions of um, some of the microbes that we know are good at breaking down plants. So here in person number one, for example, you see this blue bifidobacteria expanding quite dramatically. And that's true in a few of the other people, if you just look across the board. Um, in general, when we asked, we used our um, statistics to ask the question, how much of the variance in this data set is accounted for? by the intervention, we found that about 8% of the variability was um, attributed to the dietary intervention. Across the board, we also saw that the bifidobacteria that I mentioned before were the most um, significant one to change during the intervention. And these guys are famous for their capacity to break down complex fibers. They carry a lot of enzymes that can break down on different types of plant fibers. So it really makes sense that they would increase. We thought that we were gonna see an increase in the diversity, the overall diversity of the gut microbiome. Um, but actually in this, just within the two week intervention, if anything, we may have seen a small decrease, but it wasn't significant. So essentially the diversity stayed the same across those two weeks. But we thought about this a lot and I think when you make a big change in an environment, there's a lot of adjustment. And so it's almost like we were watching the first step in a revolution and we needed to give more time for the, the new members of the microbial community to adapt and to step in. So I would love to do longer term interventions. Um, so we've been publishing papers about this, both science papers and education focused papers for other universities that might like to lead similar classes. And next year, we have a couple of interventions planned, um, one of them together with Dr. Esserman and um, UCSF, where we're going to try a high fiber diet intervention in breast cancer survivors. 
Um, and so we're going to compare uh, using those thistle meals and using dietary counseling coming from the teaching kitchen that I've been talking to you guys about here at UCI. I also asked ChatGPT, the new AI engine, if, if they had advice for how to get people to, to how to help people eat more fiber. And actually the advice is pretty good. You know, adding fruits and vegetables, choosing whole grains, snacking on nuts and seeds, including beans. I mean, these are all things that we've just been talking about. Um, trying to replace meat with plant-based proteins like tofu or tempeh if possible. But I mean, you know, not you don't have to do all of these things to make a really big difference. I think avoiding processed food would be the other thing, if possible. Um, choosing high fiber snacks, popcorn is a really good one. Um, and uh, and to use supplements if you need to. Getting the fiber is really important. So if it's not working in your diet, finding a supplement that you can tolerate could make a really big difference. My final message is this quote from John Steinbeck that I really love. And in, in Tortilla Flat, he wrote that beans are a roof over your stomach. And he was thinking about a very different scenario where um, in that time, the people would sometimes go to the fields that had already been harvested to just try to grab any, any beans that had been left behind. And they would try to have 400 pounds of beans stored in the house for the winter. Um, and if they had that, it was like an insurance policy against starvation that winter. So we are obviously in a different era right now. Um, in many cases, we have access to too many calories, but they're all processed food and high in sugar type of calories. And so really, if we could get ourselves to lean back into these foods like beans, um, that could be an insurance policy, but rather than protecting you from starvation, it's protecting your immune system and helping you have strong responses to your cancer treatment and your vaccine treatment. Or for example, if you knew you had to take antibiotics, eating a high fiber diet before you take antibiotics is a great way to protect all the microbes in your gut and avoid infection. And there's research showing that that really does help. So my Type, my takeaways are that fiber is complex carbohydrate chains that resist quick digestion um, and that food processing often removes fiber. So eating whole foods to the extent possible is the best way to get more fiber into your diet. And it doesn't have to be expensive. Um, fiber could play a really important role in maintaining our gut health, avoiding blood sugar spikes, and even promoting our, um, our responses to vaccines and cancer treatment. Most Americans have a really big fiber gap, um, and we need both the fiber and the microbes that can break down the fiber in our gut. So that's uh, um, part of the message about the fermented foods, that if we eat fermented foods, that um, not only brings live microbes, but also molecules that the microbes love to eat and that promotes a really healthy, diverse gut microbiome. So the final message is just consider trying to find ways to increase the fiber and fermented foods in your diet. And so with that, I should thank my group and our funding that have made all this work possible. Here we are on Catalina Island recently, and I'll leave us with this um, this, you know, link to the seminars, if you're interested here, you can see the teaching kitchen. And here was a recipe we just did last week, or right before Thanksgiving, actually, where we, um, there were chocolate chip cookies that had beans in there. And I thought they were really good. Um, and it reminds me of those World War II recipes where people would sneak all kinds of veggies into chocolate cake and stuff to get and at that time, it was for a different reason. But now it's a good way to get fiber into our diets. All right, thank you very much. Let me have a look at the questions here. Great, Katrine, thank you so much. And, you know, we are, we have always wanted to better understand the connection of food and cancer risk. And I think the key intermediary is the gut microbiome because what you eat and what's absorbed really is moderated by these colonies of bacteria that live in an ecosystem in your gut. Is that fair, Katrine? Yes, I really think it is. Um, it's a really interesting 
century we've lived in where our lifestyles have changed so much. And so our exposure to microbes has ch changed at the same time. And it's hard to disentangle, you know, exactly what, you know, the order of events, but, um, but yes, I really think that our exposure to microbes is having a big impact on our, on our cancer risk. And that, yeah, we have, there's one clear message, which is that eating less processed food and getting fiber back into our diets could have a really big impact. Yeah. And it might, might have the impact, a similar impact to a drug or be an incredibly important complement to a drug like Keytruda. Another question that came up on this topic is, are there any foods that sort of cross over between cancer fighting foods and high fiber foods, or I'm assuming they both are, oh, they're all good for you, but are there any in particular that sort of are on both lists? You know, I bet that they, I bet they all are on both lists. I don't know. Can I try to, I'm trying to think of an exception. I don't know. Dr. Esserman, do you have any exceptions to that rule? I mean, I think all of the veggies that we view as full of all these great molecules for fighting cancer, they have a lot of fiber in them too, right? So yeah. berries, broccoli, beans, it's it's hard for me to think of an example where they both wouldn't be. Cauliflower, squash, all those things, mm -hmm. all the healthy cook. I mean, it turns out these are the things that are just good for your overall health. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like sometimes you hear this advice about eating the rainbow and trying to um, right. eat lots of brightly colored foods with different colors. I think that advice lines it's really great. up with the cancer fighting and the high fiber. Totally agree. Let's see what other questions we have in the side here. Um, and there's there's one for people who may have trouble with or have GI issues. Are there any fiber rich foods that are maybe known to be less impactful on your GI system or easier to digest that might be better choices for them? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's pretty individual too. So I'm sure it's uncomfortable to have to experiment with that, but I do think it's individual. I, I don't have a universal answer. I see um, in the comments, there's something about Metamucil crackers. I don't think I've ever heard of a Metamucil cracker. I'm very familiar with the Metamucil powder, which comes from psyllium husks. So that's plant-based. So that seems like a great idea. I guess one big picture thing to say there is that Miralax, which is used for sometimes the same reason as Metamucil, both words start with M, but they are very, very different. Metamucil comes from plants. It's psyllium husks. That I would get fully behind, whereas Miralax is is not. And so, um, yeah, if, if Metamucil is working, I think that's that's a good a good one to try. And then just experimenting with smaller amounts of, of foods and introducing them, like add just a couple of chia seeds to your yogurt and make sure you drink a lot of water. And maybe over the course of weeks, you can increase it without having any negative impact. Someone um, wanted to know if pumpkin pie counted, but I guess if you're going to add sugar, you might as well disguise it in a bunch of pumpkin. That probably will be help, helpful. I mean, I think pumpkin pie counts. I think getting getting the, <laughs> getting the fiber in is so important that it's it's worth it. But um, I mean, I guess if there was something I would advise against, it's like, for example, drinking juice because or drinking any beverage that's full of sugar. That's such a quick way to get really rough problems with blood sugar spikes. And then, you know, juice is basically the fruits and vegetables with the fiber removed. So I guess that would be something I would suggest eating the whole food instead of the juice. So yeah, I think pumpkin pie counts. Um, I've seen some questions about um, impacts on weight and obesity, which is also a risk factor for breast cancer. So that's a great point. And yes, I, I think fiber really does help with weight. I think it helps people feel full, which signals to our brains that we're not needing to eat more. And, um, Avoiding blood sugar spikes also avoids insulin spikes. And, you know, if, if there's something you want to do to help with both weight and type two diabetes risk, it's avoiding insulin spikes. So adding the, um, adding the fiber back to our diets really can help with that. Um, and then it looks like Carol has a question. Carol, do you want to ask your question? 
I just wanted, I'm the one that put in about the IBS and the Metamucil crackers. Mm -hmm. So there is a specialist here at UCSD where I'm at. Oh. Um, and he said it, some people consider it counterintuitive. Uh, but I think one of the reasons for using the crackers instead of the powder is that you're essentially diluting the amount of the psyllium that you can get. And um, I know our family has a history of IBS and, and they've all, they've had really good results with, with his recommendation um, of uh, much less trouble. So um, that's where I'm getting the information from is, uh, and I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, his name is skipping me at the moment, but but he is at he he is at UCSD. The and that's the Metamucil crackers. Pardon. The, and that's he's recommending that using Metamucil is a with yes. coated crackers. Yeah, and, and I Metamucil and and I crackers. think the other idea is that it's much more palatable. Two things. One is you're not diluting it and and making yourself full by also having the liquid that goes with it. But the other is that um, you're more likely to, to eat the crackers <laughs> regularly <laughs> instead of saying, oh man, I got to drink this dang powder again. So, though they, I noticed in the store, they now have orange flavored uh, powder. <laughs> I, yeah. I haven't tried it. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, the one thing that I, I would say is, you know, I think there's enough data on the healthiness of fiber that it can't hurt anyone and will likely, be, you know, be extremely helpful in terms of being able to figure out whether this is what should be, that this is what we should be doing around cancer treatments. It's going to take us a lot of work to prove it. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, to add one more thing. Uh, for Thanksgiving, I actually... Uh, don't buy the canned pumpkin. I actually buy pumpkin, the pie pumpkins and make my pumpkin pies from the, from the full pumpkin. pumpkin. Yeah. So I think in general, not getting stuff that's processed and really getting as close as you can to the fruit or the root <clears throat> is probably, you know, when people say, well, can I take a pill? I'm like, in general, no. <laughs> You really have to get as close to the food itself or when people want you to buy their dietary supplements and stuff. I mean, they're usually quite expensive and not very good and not, you know, so you're much better off eating the raw food. Yeah, I really agree with that. But I think it's a challenge to tolerate fiber if you have IBS. I can understand that that's a challenge. So if you're getting advice that's helping, you know, it's sometimes I think even in the in the doctor's clinics, they're advising against fiber for people with IBS because it can cause they are, more symptoms. actually. And that they are, to me, I do. think I I know other I know people who have put a lot of energy into finding a way to, you know, finding foods that have fiber in them that they can tolerate and building up their tolerance towards them. And I think it's helped. So but it's kind of individual too. It looks like there's another question about suggestions for fermented foods other than yogurt and kimchi, vinegars, salad dressings, those types of things. Yeah, I mean, um, salad vinegars and um, salad dressings are a tricky one to talk about because they often contain a lot of other processed food ingredients that can be very unhealthy for your gut. So um, I guess I would want to think more, more carefully about the salad dressing but, but if you use healthy oil and if you use healthy oil and and actually instead of having two thirds oil and one third vinegar, you can have two thirds vinegar and one third oil. And honestly, just use less of it. It's delicious if you like vinegary things. So which I do. There's starting to be so many really good vinegars these days, too. Oh, I think so many. Yeah. All the different infused vinegars. It's so great. The balsamic vinegar is great, you know. Mm -hmm. And just a little, put some of that on, just a little drop of oil, and it's great. Um, another fermented food that you might not have thought of is miso. Like when you're making a soup broth, you can add miso, um, and that can be really, really good. Oh, does miso have a lot of fiber? 
No, but well, maybe a little bit, but I meant more as a fermented food that it contains oh, for, okay. microbial fermentation products. Yeah. Um, okay. I see there's a question from Mary Ann Snyder. Let me see if I can find that. Oh, um, eaten quite a bit of fiber for many years. Um, and they have not helped with GI issues. Um, yeah, I mean, I I hear you. That that's tough. I don't I don't have a specific suggestion. Um, and the musical crackers, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. Good point. Um, All right. Yeah. No we're question. getting. Yeah, we're getting up to our the end of the hour. If there are any other questions, please feel free to add them in. Um, I think we have a poll question for uh, the next topic, though, um, as I mentioned, we do have our next one in December about alcohol and breast cancer risk, um, oh, but yes, so uh, December 18th, we're a week earlier due to the holiday, um, but please do indicate if there are other topics for the new year that we can slot in. We do have some more um, time if you have additional questions um, to ask Dr. Whiteson too. By the way, we did get some questions ahead of time. You have many fans out there, some of them on this call. So thank you for being here. I know um, there's a lot of appreciation for your expertise and your research and answering everyone's questions today. Well, one of the exciting things is if we know that someone is at risk for um, fast growing cancers that are often the immune driven cancers, that fiber would be particularly important because fiber may be the natural way that you develop immunity. So these are the kinds of things that we're trying to think about uh, to go from the research you know, to the practical here. Um, I think it might make a big difference. And the thing that's so cool about fiber is it's accessible to everybody and it's inexpensive. Uh, beans are inexpensive. Many of the things, as Katrine said, are things that people can afford and can find ways to incorporate into their diet. So it fulfills our needs for having equity uh, and, and have solutions that work for everybody of every means. And uh, um, even people who live in food deserts can get beans and and you know um, anyway, thank you Katrine uh, for educating everybody and I think it's super exciting uh, that we're really trying to move the field forward and try and think about you know how we can not only do a better job of screening but do a better job of reducing the risk of breast cancer. Absolutely. Yeah. And making sure people have good life quality uh, if after they've had cancer treatment too. So um, yeah, well, thank you guys very much for the opportunity. Um, if there's still more questions. And we'll post, Katrine, we'll post your, uh, your series on um, your cooking series. Yeah, oh. we, we put the link in the Zoom, but we will share it on our website as well. And um, if people have questions or can't find it, you're always welcome to email us and um, ask for it as well. Um, and we'll be posting this recording too. So um, if you know someone who might be interested in listening to this, you can always share it with them as well. All right. Great.